familiar with ASP, we are an educational bipartisan institution uh, founded originally by Republicans, Democrats, generals, and businessmen and women. And the purpose behind us is to educate the public about topical issues with a national security slant to it. And I think today you're going to hear Tom talk about two of those big topics, American competitiveness being one of them, which we feel very strongly about, and then the Law of the Sea Convention. Of course, one of our original founders was Senator Kerry, and he is an avid fan of the Law of the Sea Convention. He could not be here this morning because, in fact, Congress is recessing this afternoon and pretty busy this morning, but he did call me yesterday and then he sent me a quote out of a statement he made before the Foreign Relations Committee yesterday, and I'm, I'm going to read a little bit of it. And he said, this is a quote from Senator Kerry, I believe with absolute, absolute certainty that we have much to gain and nothing to lose through ratification, and I am convinced that if we can get past the politics of this toxic moment, we can get there on the merits. I will work to see that we do. One thing I know well is that if we don't try, and if we are cowed into submission by the specter of this political season, we'll never get anywhere on any issue. And so I'm determined to keep the process moving forward and to give proponents an opportunity to make their case and fight for a fair debate. To do anything else would be to shrink from the duty we all share in this institution, and particularly on this committee, to find the facts, not the politics, and act accordingly. So you can see where he feels about law of the sea convention. But Tom, I know you're going to talk about American competitiveness probably more so, but we've got a pretty strong crowd in here that's interested in law of the sea. Let me lay out some ground rules for the morning. Uh, I'm going to do a quick introduction of General Chrisman. Uh, then Tom will get up and speak. The floor will be his. When he's done, we'll do a q and I'll moderate the Q&A. When we have the Q&A, if you could please raise your hand, I'll choose you. Stand up, introduce yourself, and ask a very quick, succinct question, and we'll, we'll move quickly. I think you've got until 9.30, so hopefully we'll use the time fruitfully. This is on the record. Uh, General Chrisman has long been a board member of the American Security Project, I think one of our founding fathers, as a matter of fact. Uh, a distinguished combat veteran, retired in 2001 after five years as the superintendent of West Point. He is currently the Senior Vice President for International Affairs at the U.S. Chamber of Commerce. Ladies and gentlemen, General Chrisman. Thanks very much, Steve. I feel like a founding grandfather, <laughs> but I'm honored to have this moment here, both to thank the American Security Project uh, and General Cheney for his leadership, as well as to introduce Tom Donahue. It's been my honor to work with Tom now for nearly 10 years. And it's the first opportunity in a decade that I've had to introduce Tom formally to an audience like this. So it gives me great pleasure to stand before you and to say a few words, very few words, about, about Tom. Tom has been the president of the U.S. Chamber of Commerce for 15 years. And in the course of those 15 years, he has transformed the U.S. Chamber of Commerce into what is unarguably this country's preeminent business association. But he's done more than that, in my judgment. He's also, in many respects, transformed the American public opinion about the importance of economic prosperity and well-being, economic strength, to our nation's security. And since that's an underpinning of the whole ethos of ASP, it's a particular pleasure to welcome Tom, representing the U.S. Chamber, to this audience and to this organization. Tom is a son of New York City. He's proud and passionate about his roots. St. John's University in Adelphi. Tom Donahue is Big Apple to the core. Sorry, Tom, I just had to. <laughs> um, Senator Kerry's comment, which I was going to read as well, is so true as a segue to Tom, to Tom's remarks. And that is Senator Kerry's saying, in this season, we can't be cowed into submission by the specter of the political season. Tom Donahue has never been cowed into submission on any issue, let alone politics. And it's a great pleasure because of the passion that I have about law to see and about the security agenda of this organization to welcome formally to the American Security Project and to this audience the President of the U.S. Chamber of Commerce, Mr. Thomas J. Donahue. Tom. Thank you very much, Dan, and General Cheney, thank you for inviting me today. I'm very pleased to be here, and good morning, everyone. I, I uh, woke this morning.
morning, realizing it's the last day that the Congress is going to be in town. <clears throat> it's the middle of the vacation season, and who the hell is going to come and listen to me <laughs> talk about these issues? But I'm pleased to be here. I'm pleased to have been introduced by Dan, who has been a great supporter of our institution for a long time, a great personal advisor to me. We call him all the time for his experience, for his judgment, and his insight. And besides that, I'm very proud to call this old man with grandchildren now uh, my friend. Uh, I'd also like to thank uh, General Cheney and Paul for their kind invitation to be here and for the work they're doing. In addition to, in addition to Dan, the Chamber shares more connections with you and your board. Uh, we know about two-thirds of the people on it. Uh, for example, Jim Jones, who came to the Chamber after his long tour of the Marines and is our, uh, serving us in many ways to start our energy security system. Uh, we enjoy a good working relationship with Senator Kerry. In fact, I have been called out and mentioned on numerous occasions that I was seen at a hockey game with Senator Kerry. The only reason they saw us is everybody else in the joint had on red shirts and we were sitting there in blue suits. <laughs> I have been seen at dinner with Senator I can't imagine what a terrible thing that must be for some people on one side of the aisle or the other. The fact is, the Senator is a very interesting fellow. He also has some very strong views, and he enjoys a good glass of wine. I like having dinner with Carrie. <laughs> Recently, I testified before the Senate Foreign Relations Committee in support of the Law of the Sea Treaty, and we'll talk about that topic a little more. Uh, now, you have attracted here, this organization, a fascinating group of people. Uh, I'm not sure whether they were looking for a place uh, to hide with common souls or to put together their energy and their effort to represent the, the issues that you feel strongly about, from national security to the environment. And you're represented with people that are interested in those issues today in a hyper-partisan atmosphere that we're now living in, scoring political points seems to count more than actually getting something done. You conduct your work here in a nonpartisan way, you're proactive, you're solutions-oriented, and you seek consensus, and I applaud that. Now look, a lot of young people here, a lot of folks that would like to ask a lot of questions. I'm gonna do my shtick because there are some things I want to talk about, but I'll get quickly to the discussion, and I'll answer any of your questions. The only thing you got to do is tell me who you are so that I know what you really mean. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> One more word about ASP. We, uh, we applaud uh, them for the recognition and, and, and really putting some sense into the relationship between national security and economic strength. If you don't have one, you can't have the other. Uh, earlier in the year, ASP's board sent a letter uh, to the bipartisan congressional leadership with this warning. If America loses its competitiveness, our global influence and our national security will suffer. On the other hand, um, Bob Zellick, who has just stepped down as head of the World Bank, said at a board meeting recently, that we are one strong economic deal, that is a tax and spending deal, from reasserting America's leadership economically and, and geopolitically around the world. So everybody has a sense of the need. The question is, how do we get there? And we couldn't agree more with either or both of those comments. Security can no longer be defined solely by the projection of global power or quantitative military edge or nuclear throwaway. Increasingly, it's about global competitiveness, qualitative edge in innovation and trade weight. And it's not just the observation of business leaders that gets us there and of foreign policy experts, but our military leaders have come to understand that as well. It's as simple as this. We need prosperity to pay for security. Without security, we can't have prosperity. This is not a new idea. It goes back to the founding of our nation. In more recent times, we see it explicitly reflected in NATO's founding charter, 
we see it as uh, espoused by many presidents. Harry Truman, for example, once said, our relations, foreign and economic, are indivisible. Uh, he put the concept to the test. There is no better example of how economic might can translate into greater national security than the Marshall Plan. And to rebuild Europe from the ashes of World War II was a system that could only be done by a strong economy. Without a robust economy, America could not have invested billions of dollars to rebuild Europe, and it could not have uh, reaped the benefits of that investment. Two decades of unprecedented economic growth in Western Europe and political stability to bring an end to the centuries of bloodshed on the continent have had their benefits to us. And by the way, let me make a little sidebar comment. Right now, if you talk to the Chinese, you talk to the US, you talk to anybody that's worried about the global economy, they all start with the same deal. What's going on in Europe? Because Europe is the largest export location for China and for ourselves, and then connect the China-US arrangement, and you've got economic challenges right now. And of course, America's market-based economic system went on to help defeat the Soviet view of the world. In just a few past years, Secretary Clinton, to her great credit, has put economic statecraft at the center of the State Department's agenda. Economic statecraft recognizes that we have to advance our global leadership at a time when power is more often measured and exercised in economic terms. Think about the issues in, in Iraq. The real issues were not fighting a war. That was done in a hurry. The real issues were putting the peace together on an economic basis, and that's very difficult. And so the important link between national security and economic strength is not a new concept, as I said, but it is getting more significant attention and understanding that it's had for a long time. Now the American economy, just so we can get to something I really know a lot about, is barely growing. It, uh, its continued economic uh, preeminence has been openly questioned. We are coming off two protracted wars. Many wonder about the America's ability to engage the world and to project power if it is in economic decline. And as I said, the Eurozone economies are also in trouble. And what if the Eurozone collapses? Now there is a real serious problem. What if there is widespread and violent protest against austerity measures? We've seen some of those. Or growing resentment towards Germany, who are the only people in that sphere who can put up the cash and stabilize that environment. And some say, are they buying what they couldn't do in two wars? very interesting time. And what are the global security implications of all of that? At the same time, developing economies are on the rise. China's economic progress has been astounding. We see China aggressively pursuing deals to secure badly needed natural resources, uh, to exercise geopolitical influence across the globe, and to sell its products and services far and wide. Why not? They have one point, people say 1.3, try 1.4 billion people, a little side thing. I was in China, as I'll say in a minute, a couple of weeks ago, and we've been having a series of meetings with them, and they brought in some of the governors of the provinces. And I was talking to one at a dinner, and I said, Governor, how many people do you have in your province? Well, he thought for a minute, he said, 128 million. I thought to myself, that's bigger than California. That was funny. <laughs> uh, I was in China, as I said, uh, two weeks ago. We traveled there to co-sponsor a investment seminar on trying to attract more uh, Chinese investments to the United States to try and explain to them, because they're paranoid about CFIUS and all this other stuff. I said, look, why don't you guys, you got a lot of smart people, why don't you go do some serious studies of the, the activity in the United States when one co company buys another? 
sometimes there are three companies that want to buy the same company. It's all kinds of goings on. And then you've got all the regulatory agents, you've got all the banking issues, you have all the press, you have all the stocks up and down. I mean, the problems you have are very small compared to the guys. So we're not, we're not uh, acting against you. We're not challenging China. It's the way we do business. So learn how to do business there like we're trying to learn how to do business uh, here uh, in China. Uh, then we had uh, our third meeting of our track two uh, meeting. We've been having a meeting, a series of meetings. Twelve CEOs from both sides, but on the China side, some of them are state-owned industries, and uh, eight, nine uh, former government officials. Somebody said to me, why don't you take current, current government officials? Bless you. And that's because they can't say anything. You know, if you're in the, well, they say it quietly, they just don't say it publicly. Uh, but the bottom line is, by having former government officials, and a great example is Bob Kimmon, former undersecretary, a, a deputy secretary of treasury, who knew more about CFIUS than anyone else. And every time the Chinese start their litany of the saints about CFIUS, he stands up and gives them all the numbers, and they shut up, and we go back to business. Every three times we've had this meeting, three times Kimmy gets up, gives his thing, they sit down, we get on with business. Uh, but these meetings have been very, very important, and I would give you simply my own view that this one was the first one where we really scrapped all the briefing sheets and the thick speeches and had some real serious discussion on how we can address some of our problems. Uh, now, while we were there, uh, Beijing, uh, in addition, you can't breathe the air very well, uh, was uh, crawling with the uh, caravans of, and limousines. And it was uh, all, many of the African uh, nations were there with their leadership um, talking about all the assets they were going to sell to China. Um, the, uh, they, had, they were there to be wooed with, uh, China, by China who wants resources, market opportunities, and strategic advantages in Africa. Uh, Dan, I think you told me once that you could take uh, India and China and something else and stick it all in Africa and you'd have some room left over. <clears throat> it's an unbelievable place because I've been there but not enough. Neither has American business. You know, we go everywhere else, but the real future and where we ought to be spending a lot of time is in Africa. That summit um, between the Chinese and uh, African enterprises ended up in, with more than 20 dealings and, and signing eight cooperation projects worth eventually billions of dollars. What are we doing in Africa? So it's clear to me that American competitors recognize the power of economic diplomacy in advancing their strategic interests, so what are we going to do? So let's talk a little bit about strengthening our economy. And by the way, we can all have different views about this. Try and forget the political season for a minute and see if we can focus and by the way, in the silly season, it doesn't matter whether you're Republican or Democrat, everybody's looking to try and figure out what's that one that edge I can get by what I'm going to say. But let's talk more about what we're going to do. In fact, we had uh, former Secretary Paulson um, uh, at the chamber the other day. In the morning, we spent time talking about his real interest, which is China. And the afternoon, we spent time talking about uh, the realities of, uh, of our economy. And uh, he has a think and act tank at the University of Chicago. And I said, well, uh, Mr. Secretary, how do you get from a think tank to a think and act tank? Oh, he said, it's simple. You're the only person paying all the bills. <laughs> <laughs> so um, let's talk about strengthening our economy. How do we get there? Uh, economic growth can't be generated without the private sector. And the private sector cannot generate economic growth without realistic policies from government that support business and job creation. Uh, we may not always agree, any of us here, on which policies work, but we certainly want to look at them. Uh, but one of the first things I want to say a word about, because you know, Senator Kerry's guys are here, and I'm, this is easy for me because I really agree. One of the really important economic things uh, our government could do is uh, to bolster our economy to enhance our national security and to reassert our global leadership would be to finally, uh, finally 
have to just about everybody else in the world has done so, um, confirm our um, full participation in the Law of the Sea Treaty. The treaty would be a boom to the U.S. economy by providing American companies the legal certainty and stability they need to hire and invest uh, for activities off our shores. It would codify the U.S.'s legal right to use international shipping lanes to lay and service underwater cables and to develop vast amounts of oil, natural gas, and minerals, scarce minerals, up to 600 miles off our coast on the deep seabed. Ensuring safe passages in the shipping lane is especially critical because of seafaring vessels transport, get this, more than 95% of all the goods imported or exported from the United States, including essential commodities like oil, but I'm going to tell you we don't have to import so much oil off the floor. The law of the sea would continue to form the basis of maritime law, with or without approval, um, and, you know, if we don't, if we're not there, we're not going to have anything to say about this. Our nation's interests are best protected by being an active participant in the process. Now, like any agreement, the treaty isn't perfect, but since the last fix was some not many years ago, we solved just about everything we had there. And by the way, you know, we, if anybody listened to the testimony, you can hear all these arguments. But ultimately, ultimately, if we're not there, we have no voice in what they do. Oh yes, we have a strong navy, and we can tell them to stay away from our shores. But we don't need to do that. Uh, and if we are there, we have an ultimate veto on many things that they would want to do. And I know there are a lot of people against this. The only thing I would suggest, without arguing the merits, are you really telling me, uh, those that uh, came out opposed to it recently, are you thinking about where it was before the last fix? Or are you telling me since everything you raised as being important has been fixed, that you still don't like the deal and why is that? Uh, so if we want to be isolationists, if we want everybody else to have the opportunity to deal with these issues without us, and then maybe we're doing the right thing, but I don't think so. So let's talk about energy for a minute, because that's one of the great things the law of the sea would do to help us. Developing energy off our coast would have huge economic and national security benefits to us, and so would developing our onshore resources and strengthening our energy infrastructure, and we can do so in an environmentally friendly way. The most significant environmentally friendly way that we have done anything that we've done in this country is all about efficiency, because today, as opposed to 20 some years ago, we use half the amount of energy that we use to create the same amount of BTUs and, and energy in all sorts of forms that we did that long ago. That was a huge environmentally friendly way, and that, by the way, is one of the significant things we have led the world in. Um, the importance of more secure supply of affordable energy is obvious, and energy underpins a robust economy. Increasing domestic uh, production would fuel growth at home, create jobs, fill government coffers, and reduce our reliance on federal sources. And now, I think, is the time seize this opportunity. We're sitting on, whether you like it or not, we have learned in the last 15 years that we're sitting on huge supplies of energy on the land and off our coast. We can access it through methods like hydraulic fracturing. By the way, we've been doing that for 68 years. And it wasn't until we became more visible that people are talking about it. And we can do it in a safe and a friendly way. And yet, we've locked most of all of this away more than 86% of the federal offshore lands and 80% of the federal onshore lands are off limits to getting energy from them. But by the way, we're going to fix that, and before I'm finished here in a few minutes, I'll prove that to you. We need to unlock these areas to vastly expand, and there are some people here who will not agree with this, our oil and gas production, and we need an all of the above approach, traditional fossil fuels, nuclear fuels, hydro, solar, wind, and biomass. The chamber supports 300 of those kinds of energy production activities. We have vigorously supported them, and they are tied up in, not in my neighborhood, 
not in my town, not in my state, or not if my union doesn't do the work. We've got to try and string those loose. We also have to allow the, allow the Keystone Pipeline to be built, which would create jobs at home and bolster our relationships with our key ally, and Canada. By the way, we just gave the authority to build from Oklahoma to the Gulf, and as soon as the election's over, we're going to do this thing, and we're going to do it because if we don't do it, they're just going to turn right on the pipeline, take it to the coast, and sell it to China, and we would much rather do business uh, with Canada than with a lot of the people we're currently doing business with. Now, let me be clear. Energy development is every bit a national security issue as it is an economic one. You could look at Chevron, who was drilling in Ecuador and is now looking at a, what is it, an $18 billion uh, legal judgment against them on a deal where we got the film of the lawyers paying off the judges on a thing that never happened. Or you can look at where we're getting oil from very dangerous places around the world. And we ought to do it here. Our allies in North Asia are sure to see it that way. When I was in Korea and when I was in Japan, all those guys wanted to talk about is how do we get energy and maybe you want to go look up the treaties that we're still party to that require us to help some of them if they can't get energy. Now increasingly, U.S. domestic production and the strengthening of North American energy market is only half the question. The other half involves maintaining the reliability reliability of our energy infrastructure. And if you looked at today's newspaper, everybody's talking about the fact that the ability to generate is one thing, the ability to deliver energy another. And the one job you don't want is to work for Pepco. Now, I have a lot of sympathy for those guys. They put up all those lines. They put them up in an area where we have unbelievable trees. And they've been trying to trim the trees. And the residents don't want the trees trimmed. They can't get their, they can't get their um, uh, capital budgets approved. Everybody's mad at them. And they turn the whole thing around a couple of weeks from the worst storms that we've ever had. Uh, I think the reason everybody's focusing, you saw what happened in India. One half of the country was without power. Could that happen here? I don't know. Look at the paper. Or what about terrorism? Could that happen here? A lot easier to do it here with the current infrastructure. And why aren't we dealing with infrastructure? That's a huge issue here. Our current electrical system is vulnerable in so many ways, but the biggest are age, regulatory red tape, and uh, the failure to upgrade our, our systems. We need to do a number of things to invest them. We need to reduce the regulatory red tape and lawsuits that prevent upgrading energy. I mean, there are some people who believe that if we don't do it, they won't come. Our population, thank God, continues to grow because demographics is destiny. You look at Japan, what are they doing? They've got a negative population growth. Just figure that out. So we've got to work this very, very, very hard. And we have to tell the government it's not their job to pick winners and losers. This is an all um, way. We're going to do this in every way we can. Now, yesterday, no, day before, we had a thing at the chamber about the Canadian miracle, and I'm going to say something that's a further speech. I'm taking it out of there. I'm going to say it here. What's the Canadian miracle? Look what they did. Just before the big crisis, the economic crisis, they fixed their banks because they were in a big mess. Then the crisis started, and they fixed their entitlements. They didn't get rid of them. They made some adjustments in entitlements, which are the one thing that are eating up this economy, driven by a simple reason. People are living, Dan and I shouldn't be here anymore. You know? and, well, we like it and we're staying. <laughs> and, uh, uh, and, and so, and then they lowered all their taxes. And then they expanded, they expanded their trading agreements around the world. And all of a sudden, their economy is in, we would say, much better shape than almost anybody. The key was they had a cash cow, a cash cow that let them have the money to bridge all of those things to the benefit of their economy and their people and their institutions. Cash cow was energy. Now, if you go to China, if you go to Japan, they want to do all those things. 
but their demographics are in trouble and they don't have a cash cow. We do. We have the largest cash cow in the world. And we ought to figure out how to use it. We can take some of that into the questions. Let me say a word about cybersecurity. You watch the papers. Everybody's dumping on the chamber on cybersecurity. And they're saying, well, we'd have had a deal if it wasn't for the chamber. That's true. And it's a crummy deal. Uh, so we're not going to have it. But we'll get a deal in September. We've been in the cybersecurity thing for six years. We have an organization that has all the big companies and all the agencies of government, alphabet agencies, from the Defense Department and the NSA and everybody else. And we're the product of cyber attacks all the time from all around the world. And I'm not, you know, some people have written about it, and it's not just China. People want to know what we're doing. People want to know what we're going to say in a meeting. People want to know what everybody's going to say. And we have got to do something about cyber, but we can't make it a regulated government issue. And I'll give you an overriding reason. If we were to pass a deal that was regulated, then it'll take a year and a half to write the rules on how we're going to do that. In that time, 14-year-old kids all around the world will have found 14 different ways to crack into systems that didn't exist yesterday. And, you know, I still remember when we were first attacked and the, um, and our guy that runs this stuff is really, and he said, it can't happen, they can't get my systems. I said, listen, son, they're in the White House, they're in the CIA, they're in the Defense Department, you know, they're in everything you can think about, they're in your system, so get over it. And, and I could, somebody asked me questions about that, I'll tell you later. So I've been talking to senators all about that all, all week. Uh, we're going to make it. But, you know, Harry Reid running around doing what he wants to do to, you know, see who he can beat up on is fine. But we're not, there's not going to be a vote on that. But we will make an agreement on the, on the, the, uh, the issues that we'll take up in September and how we'll fix it. And by the way, it's simple. We've got to get a system that allows for cooperation without getting sued. We've got to get a system that isn't fundamentally built to change it the minute it is passed. And we've got to get a system that isn't built on, if you don't know what I say, we're going to embarrass you. Because if that's the case, nobody's going to tell anybody anything. And we can get that done. The rest of the bill is fine. And uh, so when you read the newspaper, don't believe everything you hear. But it is correct that one deal is not going to get a bill until it's right. Uh, let me just make a two-minute statement about infrastructure. We talked about energy infrastructure. And by the way, most of the infrastructure in this country is somehow related to energy, whether it's how we get the energy there, pipelines, rail lines, uh, other means, uh, whether it's how we get the power there, uh, whether it's how we refine things. This is all infrastructure. And we have been screwing around about a highway bill in this country for a long, long time. Now, get it straight, I have prejudices about highway bills. I used to run the Trucking Association for 13 years. I used to work for the United States Postal Service. And yes, we can talk the Postal Service jokes. Uh, but the bottom line is, we have been kidding ourselves on infrastructure. We finally got a highway bill. It's too short, and it doesn't have any way to pay it. National Security, you remember who started that highway bill? Eisenhower. He did it, and it's a national system of defense highways and of economic highways. Once again, a relationship. Um, and I try, I, you know, it has been now 19 years since the uh, federal fuel tax was increased. And, and in 19 years, everybody in this room has a car or a truck or a vehicle that gets more miles per gallon than they did back then, so therefore, even at that rate, you're getting less money than you were getting before. And, you know, what we've had gas up to four bucks. 18 years ago, what was gas? 30 cents or something? And we're only talking about grinding over five years to put a quarter in there or something. We ought to quit screwing around and get the money so that we can tell the states. See, we only pay half. States pay a quarter, local communities pay a quarter, and they're not putting up their bill of money until, you know, we're in the game and we're going to be there for a while. Another very, very important thing between security and, um, and, and, and 
economy is trade. Now look, I know all the people that say trade's bad and we shouldn't trade here, we shouldn't trade. That's great. Ninety-five percent of the people that buy stuff in the world, they live there. So if we only want to sell stuff that live here, we're going to have very, very small markets and we're not going to have long-term economic growth. And if we didn't trade in the world, we'd probably lose 20% eh, of the jobs in the country country in a very short period of time. That doesn't seem like a good idea when the option is, if we're trading vigorously, then uh, we could add 20% to the jobs over time. Now, I need somebody here to be my step. You are. Now, here's the deal. When we get a little further on, you need to ask me a question. I I've got a story for you about manufacturing. Don't we make anything anymore in America? Got the question? Hang on, we'll be back. <laughs> so the big issue, we have got you know, to take advantage of what we're doing the WTO. Um, uh, we've got to take advantage of what we're doing with all the trading groups around the world because we have a rule-based system. Therefore, we can, and by the way, do the rules always work? Do people always play by the rules? No. Guess who doesn't always play by the rules? We don't play by the rules. It took us 16 years to finally to put in the thing, the thing we put in the in the Mexican, U.S., Canadian deal about trucks moving back and forth. Why didn't we do it? Because the Congress didn't want to do it. They said, no, we're not going to do it. Well, there are options to do that, but at least you can sue each other. At least there are, there are ways to pressure each other with corrective actions, and we want to be in it. And then we want to be a party to the TPP, and that's the trade deal we want to do in Asia it's got two values. You take all of those countries over there and you get a free trade agreement all at once and you're going to find a lot of opportunities for Americans. And by the way, it's very important geopolitically that in that range of area, in the whole Asian thing, that we get together and do this together. And then we have been having long conversations. At first, everybody laughed at us with uh, European leaders. Merkel, and, and uh, we talked to when Sarkozy was there, and, and we, the, the Brits and the Irish and everyone, we had ideas. We said, why don't we get rid of all the tariffs on goods we sent back and forth uh, to Europe? Well, why would we do that? Well, we get a huge increase in uh, GDP in both communities. You create a lot of jobs. Why wouldn't we do it? Well, two reasons. First of all, I can find uh, industries in both continents that don't want to do that. You know, we, we got to have our tariff because that's how we. Or the trade negotiation guys in every one of these countries. We don't do it that way. See, they drive me nuts. If we're going to buy a company, if we're going to do a labor agreement, if we're going to do any of that, we always do all the easy things first. And then you get down to the very end and you do the hardest thing last because everybody's got a vested interest in making a deal. In trade agreements, you do the hardest thing first because everybody has a vested interest in protecting agriculture, which, by the way, the problem is we used to have huge in the United States. This is, comes back to manufacturing. You remember the question? Okay, good. In the United States, uh, you know, it was it was not very long ago that a quarter of all the population worked in agriculture. And what is it now? One and a half percent or something like that. But agriculture is the deal. So we've got to get some of these trade agreements done. We've got to have a Congress and a, an administration that supports that. By the way, there were two reasons we got the three free trade agreements done after, you know, five or six years of screwing around. The first one was, as we told everybody, as soon as, as soon as Europe made a deal with the Koreans, we were going to lose 300,000 jobs in this country. And as soon as the Canadians made a deal with the, the people in Colombia, we were going to lose half of the sales of agricultural products uh, to Colombia. And by the way, in the first month, Canada took a billion dollars worth of our exports away from us. And we said, ah, we better pass that. And the other thing is we had a guy at our place that took a thing like Duke here, and it, you know, on his computer deal, and set up a deal that you could go into the Congress, open that sucker up, show the congressman how many companies in his district were exporting or abroad. What did they learn? 
they were many, many, many times the number that he thought, and many of them were small and medium-sized companies, and then it took us three days to figure out why everybody wanted the list. They thought it was a great way to raise money, but we got the votes for those deals, and we'll get votes for more trading going forward. So let's talk in wrapping up here uh, a bit about free enterprise and the private sector. I can discuss you know, lots of things we should do here um, to, uh, to fix this economy. We're, we got a big sign in our deal that says jobs. It's all about growth. If you, until you get 3.5% growth in this country, you're not going to create a lot of jobs. So growth creates jobs. And when you get growth and you get jobs, and there's a lot of ways to do this, then that's going to fix most of our problems. If we remember what happened in manufacturing, don't ask yet, I'll tell you when. And, and so the growth in the jobs thing, if you, if you don't get them over 3%, you, you, you know, when you see the numbers, like last month they said we created 80,000 jobs, it's a lot more than that. We turn over a million jobs every month. You see, there's 10,000 people a day retire, 5,000 people a day die, it's a big country, and, and so there, we're continually filling all those jobs. So the net number of jobs we create is much more than what you hear, but the only way to put a lot of these people back to work and a lot of people coming into the workforce is growth and jobs. And then if you do infrastructure, if you do tourism, if you do energy and energy and energy, we can create all these jobs and it's a matter of public will and we'll get there. But all of it has to be based on a system. Everybody has a system. Some people have a government system. If you go and, and talk to the people in China, they have a system where the government controls everything. And by the way, in the beginning, it's fairly efficient. If you don't mind everybody telling you where you have to work and what you've got to do and when you can do it and when you can't do it. Uh, but you see, they've got massive economic growth and that's because they're coming from down here and they're moving very quickly that they're going to have 5% of their people in the middle class do the math, it's still bigger than most countries in the world. And they're going to have more people in the middle class all the time. Um, you know, my good friend, your member, Jim Jones, said that entrepreneurs, investors, and innovators are as instrumental as diplomats, generals, and politicians to winning friends, influencing attitudes at the grassroots level of the global community. So we have a system, a free enterprise system, that really allows people to take risk. And one of my problems with all the massive regulation that we've got now in healthcare and, and Dodd-Frank and the environment and all this, uh, it's, uh, it takes away, everybody's trying to get rid of failure. Everybody wants to get rid of risk. If you don't have risk and if you can't have failure, you can never have significant success. In America, our inventions, our extraordinary industries are based on risk and failure and the ability to get up off the ground and go and do it again. Now, the chamber has an affiliate, we call it SIPE, it's a part of the National Endowment for Democracy, uh, which by the way you ought to look up a little bit, it was founded by uh, Ronald Reagan on one side, the labor unions on another, a whole bunch of people, and what we see only federal money and we don't take it into the chamber, we keep it somewhere else. And we, we're, low, we're on, I guess, uh, 80 some countries around the world <clears throat> where we are teaching people about free enterprise, about corporate governance, about accounting, and all that stuff. So, look, it's a system based on you get rewarded based on what you do, you get rewarded based on the risk you take, you get rewarded on the success you get, and the country. And each of us gets a freedom with that that you never would have seen before. So let me wrap up. Uh, in all of our problems, and we have a lot, and with all of the things people say about our economy, if tomorrow we go into, we go into financial crisis around the world, where is everybody gonna put their money? They're gonna put it here. Well, why would they put it here? You know, after all, <clears throat> we have economic problems. Yeah, but we have a stable system. We have a government <clears throat> that is free with all of its regulations. We have a system that is supported, an economics that is system that's supported by our national defense and our national events and our global security is supported by an economic system. Uh, 
what are we facing now as I wrap up here? Um, we've got a plan. <clears throat> we have a way that we can fix this economy as we go up against the cliff. You know, we're going to have the elections, and then we've got 60 days to do something. And by the way, we're conflicted. On one side, we want a big deal. We want a big tax and spending deal that puts us back in the lead. On the other side, we don't want to start by taking away those tax cuts and with, we want the spending cuts. The spending cuts that are there, trillion one or two over 10 years, because they're not the right ones. If we don't do something about entitlements, you can forget all the rest of it, pack it up, go out and go to, you know, have a drink. Uh, and we're gonna have to do that. And it is very, very important to us to get a deal. The, our conflicts, we don't wanna do that right now. We want to do this, but it's going to wait a little while because anybody, liberal, Republican, the Congressional Budget Office, any think tank in town will tell you, if we pull that plug on December 31st, next week, we're in another major recession. And that probably puts 700,000 people out of work over time, and uh, we don't want to do that. So we're, we're going to work together. But here's our one last thing. We, you know, you can look at all the things we should as a country do, right? The only one problem is we don't know what's going to happen around the world. And all the things we're thinking about, we haven't figured out what's going to happen around the world. Is it going to be Syria? Is Syria going to whip out the chemical weapons? Is Israel going to feel compelled uh, to go after Iran? Uh, what's going to actually happen in Egypt? What's happening in, uh, in, in, in other places around the world? And, and the bottom line is we're going to have to deal with those whether we like them or not because they're going to affect our economy and they're going to affect our security. And the bottom line is that this is a marriage of importance, of necessity, and I hope of a certain amount of mutual respect. No economy, no security. No security, no economy. And, uh, and I'm glad to come down here and see you all. You're nice to come out on a Know, a Thursday before they all go on vacation. Uh, I had a very strong views. Did you have a question? <laughs> uh, I'm glad you asked that question. I've been spending a lot of time in the last couple of weeks looking at manufacturing. And we have done that for a long time, and I want to tell you a story. Uh, you have to, it goes from month to month, who manufactures more stuff for export, the United States or China, and one time it's the United States and one time it's China. Uh, but it's very important to understand something about manufacturing. When people ask the question, they really don't want to know how much we produce. They want to know how many people we hire to do it. And we have, depending who you talk to, we have, because of productivity, now that's a word difficult to explain, but I will in one second. Because of productivity over the last 15 years, we have taken away, and you have to just depend who you're listening to, on the bottom side, 15-20%, uh, and on the top side, 50 plus percent of the jobs we used to use, and maybe longer than that, uh, in manufacturing. Well, why did we do that? Well, we did it because we had to stay competitive around the globe. If we hadn't done it, then nobody would be buying our stuff because we wouldn't uh, be competitive globally. How did we do it? First of all, and not in the order of importance, we use robotics. And robotics do things in the automobile industry that thousands of employees use. Second of all, we use information technology. And information technology does everything from machine uh, tools to, to uh, scheduling and so on and all the things that we used to have a lot of people do. Perhaps most important, we did it in supply chain management. And that's getting all the raw materials to you, your transportation, your end delivery, your uh, supply chain management. If, if some of the young people here in this room don't know what they're going to do with their career, go into supply chain management. There's so many jobs paying a ton of money, but remember all of those things I was talking about are part of supply chain management. So what we have done is we have gotten so productive 
that we can now make a car or an airplane or a can of soup uh, with a fraction of the people we used to do before. So when people ask us about manufacturing, they are asking us not are we productive and are we as efficient or as cheap or do we get better pro quality products. They want to know what happened to all those jobs. And all those jobs went to the same place that those agriculture jobs. Remember years ago, you said everybody had a little farm and now you have all these huge commercial farms which gives us cheaper food and which makes us one of the two places in the world that are going to feed the world. One is the United States and the other is Brazil. United States can. Um, so, uh, I, the reason I had you ask that question, the reason I want you to see cause and effect. I want you to see the same thing happens in defense. We get more efficient, we use more people or less people in different places, and you're all part of the problem. You all got your computers, you all have your, your handheld devices, you all operate on the internet. Well, when we did all that, we took away tons of jobs, but we created lots of jobs in that industry. And what are we going to do with manufacturing? And what are we going to do with all those people? We're going to create a lot of jobs in manufacturing and expansion. And by the way, all those people we're talking about, we can hire every day on one of them over the next two or three years to do the energy thing. And the speech, who else got to speak? <laughs> all right, yeah, Tom, I can see that you haven't lost your passion or your sense of humor or candor either. Um, but they're not here to hear me. I, I, we've got a limited amount of time here, so I, I think we've got a couple. Like, we think, okay, we've got a couple of questions here. Caitlin? Um, I'm Caitlin Andrew. I'm the Google Law Committee for the Oceans. But I have a question for my engineering background. I just spent a week at the International Seabed Authority in Kingston. They approved five mine sites for countries, including private firms in the United Kingdom and Belgium. Each of those sites has the potential to grow into a $2 billion capital investment, a billion dollars a year of operating expenses, over 500 jobs, and producing a billion and a half dollars of critical materials for domestic consumption. Apparently, the only reason we aren't part of this is a dislike of an international organization. Does American business have difficulty working within an international rules-based organization, particularly one where the U.S. would have a veto over those regulations? Is that a problem? Is that keeping us away from this billion, this multi-billion dollar opportunity? Can I ask you one question before I answer? Do you remember where those sites were? Um, one site, the U.K. site is about 100 miles outside of the Mexican exclusive economic zone. The Belgian site took the site that had originally been licensed to Deep Sea Ventures, uh, one of the four sites that had been licensed under U.S. law, and went to one of the, the Belgian partners. A French site is located on Mid-Atlantic Ridge. A Korean site is located on the Southwest Indian Ocean Ridge. And Kiribati, a small island country south of Hawaii, uh, has a site now about 100 miles outside of their exclusive economic zone. And they'll be looking for contractors to come in and help them develop. Right, and by the way, the next set of five sites will be off our shores and off our lands, and, uh, and we're not gonna, you know, whether we wanna go out and start a war. All we have to do is join this issue. The American business community, oh, we have a few people that have this or that. But across the board, businesses large and small in this country wanna do this deal. We want to be protected from others, you know, taxing us in a way uh, that is unreasonable uh, in terms of what we take off the sites. Uh, but uh, we have a, a veto that we don't have now. And I just think, I understand there were things in that, that uh, agreement that had to be fixed, that have been fixed. And there are some organizations here that are using that deal as a great way to raise money. I think after the election, we'll be able to get this done. And I give Kerry a lot of credit, um, Senator. Uh, he's got a good sense on this. People are talking about what he's doing it for. I think he really cares about it. And I do, because I think it's nothing but a great addition to our economic system and our security system. Great answer. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. All the way back. Thank you very much. My name is uh, Nia Quinton. 
an immigrant from uh, Ghana. I'm so glad that you talked about seeing the Africans in uh, Beijing being wooed. Um, when I pay attention to how China is, is uh, spreading its economic might in Africa, the thing that I wonder about is why is the U.S. allowing them a free field? I see the U.S. having four big advantages over the Chinese in Africa, from democracy to sports, which is competition. You mentioned free enterprise. The Chinese embraced it after Deng Xiaoping only 10 years ago. As I remember from my business classes, you've been doing free enterprise forever. So I think you are better at it. And then there is also what I call the African connection. Black people in this country. Five million people like me who were born on the continent, others who were born here. So it seems to me you have all the advantages. So my question for you is, what is stopping American business from outcompeting and outbeating the Chinese in Africa? Because my Africans tell me that we would rather have the American system than the Chinese system, which in 30 years you can't breathe in Beijing, as you yourself said. So thank you. That's a damn good question. The Chamber has recently put together a major group in our international area uh, on the African trade and development side. And, uh, and we're, sending, we're spending a lot of time there and sending, sending and working with a lot of businesses to get there. Obviously, there are things you didn't, you know, very important reasons to be involved in Africa. Uh, strategic, uh, but economic natural resources, not only oil and gas, we have a lot of that ourselves now, but precious metals and, and critical metals, it's, a, it's, a, it's an unbelievable continent. When we just begin, it's, it's sort of unknown to people. Right? They've been so busy, they did Europe, then they did Asia, now we're doing the Americas. Well, let's go to Africa, that's why we're doing this issue. Because got a, you know, it, it's just an unbelievable resource. It's like it's like um, it's the next great opportunity, and, and by the way, I am I am very much aware of what China is doing, and I think I hope uh, that we will. And I think Hillary Clinton's worked hard on this. I, I, I hope that the next administration in this Congress, with our help, will see this as a place that we need to expand our sphere of relationships and influence and economy and security. Exporting gas, or should we keep it here for, for cheap 
American manufacturing. No, no, that's a great question. I, I have one of the five best jobs in America. And if you think about who we represent, it's just about you know, all the industries. And, uh, and I understand the push and take. You know? First of all, the price of gas, if it gets too low, and it's just about was there, it's come up a little bit. Uh, we're not going to dig it out of the ground. I mean, some people will because they get a quick short-term advantage, but you're not going to get people that are taking that stuff out of two bucks a, a, a unit because you can't make money. I mean, I'm at three and a half. So then the chemical guys, remember, they moved appropriately, exactly what we would have done. They moved a lot of their production offshore, a lot of it to the Mideast, because natural gas is the seed corn of chemicals. So they come around and they say, listen, we shouldn't let anybody export natural gas. Well, why not? Well, prices go up. I can't get out of here. You know, we certainly have enough of it to keep the price in line. If the price is too low, nobody's getting it out of the ground. And exporting it some is, after we take care of you guys, is the way to start paying down debt and deficit. That's part of the deal. And by the way, digging it out of the ground here and paying royalties and paying taxes people paying taxes and companies paying taxes. Just think about natural gas, oil, there's a lot of oil, and energy as the substitute for having to really cut all of our social programs and the way to pay down our debt and deficit. Um, we're gonna bring a lot of that manufacturing home because of this gas and for another reason. It's not exactly nice weather in the Middle East right now. All kinds of problems going on there, so they're not going to take it all, but they're going to bring some of it here. Um, you know, the other issue there's a huge set of natural gas issues. In there. I'm on the board of Union Pacific River. We haul a lot of coal, but we also haul stuff for digging natural gas, so we're fine. But you know, we had a lot of people who were all for natural gas uh, and it's a substitute for a lot of other uh, fuels until we had it, and now they're not so hot about it. But look, the bottom line is, if you want to have green energy, and as I told you, we got 300 green energy projects that we're supporting, we can't get moving. If you want to have green energy, you're not going to have it if you don't have a strong economy, period. Because all of it has to be subsidized, at least in the beginning. And the best way to get a strong economy and get ourselves out of the circumstance we're in is the clean, efficient use of all of the energy sources that we ASP couldn't agree more. One last question, anybody in the back? If not, I've, I've got one. The, uh, when you talk about American competitiveness and sources of energy uh, and the way we're subsidizing, in this latest, one of the latest markups, they cut funding for fusion, they cut funding for biomass. Um, when we think, in some cases, we're biting our nose off despite our face when we, we were somewhat on the forefront of those technologies, but we don't help them along, we won't be. What, do you have an opinion about that? Uh, yeah, I've got an opinion. Uh, no, no, you, you might start. Uh, first of all, it was a study that came out the other day. It was done by the old hands, Republicans and Democrats alike, George Schultz and Alice Ridlin and Joe Colomano and Volcker and all those guys. And they looked at states, what's going on in the state. Um, and they started with six in detail and then looked across a broad number and they're going to go in. So the states, um, the states say that they have about a one point, eh, let's say four or five trillion dollar deficit in public employee pensions. The study says try three and a half trillion. It's really more than what it is. The states say, and the study agrees, nobody's really approved any reserves for their uh, state and health care liabilities and everybody go, oh yeah yeah and, uh, and and then they say but nobody thought of this and they have a straight vertical line it just goes up like that and that's Medicaid which the states are responsible for and you know in the new health care bill there's all kinds of questions there and more federal money the reason that a lot of things are getting canned is because we have a spending system that is intimately tied to entitlements and, and uh, retirement. Now let me say a word about that. When we founded Social Security, 
The average death age was 62. So we said you could collect when you're 65. That was a pretty good deal, wasn't it? Now we changed that over time, and children, and you could retire early, but it was 62, and, and, and there were, you know, there were like 48 people paying for every person retiring. It's getting down to two to one soon, it's gonna to get to one to one. Because the death age now, and when we find, found in Medicare, the death age for men was like 58, and for women was like 62. The death code, the cumulative death age will sh of men and women will shortly uh, uh, expand beyond 80. So it's that big hunk in the middle that nobody ever set up anything to pay for. And everybody is trying to figure out how to do that. And there's going to be a lot of cuts in expenditures. Uh, I said three times during my comments, you want to have green energy, you want to have the research, the development, and the, and the, the public support of that, you know, very simple. Go get the traditional energy out of the ground, use it, sell it, and, uh, and, and spend a good portion on it looking to the future. Thank you very much.